and I'm going to be sharing my screen with you this morning just so that I can show you the presentation. Okay. So school transitions, as I say, um, there are a number of transitions that young that children and young people go through in their life, whether that be from going in from nursery to primary, um, from year to year, from primary to secondary. Um, and that's really what, what I wanted to sort of um, talk about this morning. Um, with regards to the actual legalities themselves, um, <clears throat> they haven't actually changed. And, and I have discussed that with, um, I don't know if any of you have heard of a, a gentleman called Ian Nisbet from Cairn Legal. Um, so the, the, the Additional Support for Learning Act stipulates that there are three different transition stages um, and that there are certain time skills that, 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 that they look to sort of look, look at um, for that planning. That's nursery to primary, um, where you know information should be sought no later than six months before, and then a plan put in place as to how that transition is going to work. Because there are going to be some children out there that are going to require um, a more enhanced transition. They're going to need to do more visits. They're going to need possibly more visuals. They're going to need some information through the summer holidays as well. So nursery to primary is the first transition stage that we would we would discuss with um, with parents, and that's six months before primary to secondary. Really looking at that information again, dependent on the child's needs. Some say, um, primary to secondary transitions I have heard of being discussed and seeking information actually more than twelve months before, but it really should be twelve months before. And then obviously we have your post school transitions, um, <clears throat> which again. The legal status says that it should be 12 months beforehand, um, but actually that planning can start um, as early as 14. And that really, at that age of 14, really what you would be looking at is, is this young person going to be staying on till they're 16, or is this young person going to be staying on <clears throat> until they're 19? So at that stage of 14, that would really just be a discussion as to what's happening with this young person. And a lot of schools will be doing that planning. Um, as time goes on. Um, we would say, we, we, we would expect, you know, it's really sort of, if the child's going to be staying on till sixth year or till the age of 19, it really is 12 months beforehand. Again, that depends on the child's needs because if a child has maybe got severe and complex needs, it may well be a case of, um, or actually their abilities to be able to go on to university or college are, are they would manage that but actually there's lots of little bits of work of learning to take the bus or, you know, learning to get themselves there, be those life skills that they're going to require once they go um, out into to the adult world. Um, also, the, the, the legislation, obviously, that there should always be an agreement to share information that should always be sought from parents and carers and or the young person themselves. Um, schools and fellow professionals must ensure that early well organised um, planning for transition and that, that there is adequate support in place to help the child or young person and their family through that transition process. And um, these needs and support should be identified and planned through the child plan process. So that's the Highland Council process. Um, that, that, that last bit there, that's the Highland Council process for that is, is that because we use the child plan processes, that's where the planning should, should start. Um, what I would say to you is, is that before I sort of discuss those next steps, I did get in contact with the Highland Council to ask them for information on what exactly their plan is and how things are going to be moving forward at this difficult time. Because while I appreciate those legal um, timescales are in place at the moment, we're living in a very, very different world and therefore the normal transition process is not going to necessarily apply. However, um, what I would say to you is, is that the Highland Council have um, not officially come back to me just as yet. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for that official official um, information. And once I do get that, I will pass that on to you all. But um, my understanding is, is that there, there are a lot of conversations happening within the Highland Council just now and planning happening on how those transitions can actually be taken forward. So there should be information coming out to um, the schools and parents and carers over the next couple of weeks. Um, I know that that, that um, might not be early enough for some families and young people, but I think the problem that we have is, is that because everything is so different now and we actually don't have an end time scale, you know, we don't know when the kids are actually going to be going back to school at the moment because we're still in that period of lockdown. 
Um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks we will hear more about when that possibly will be starting. So those next steps that we would we would always sort of advise any parents to sort of take um, is is to you know spend some time actually at this point in time because children young people from from what I've been listening to from parents just now their concerns are still there for what's going to happen when they go to school and possibly slightly more um, slightly more more anxiety provoking because we don't have an end scale. When they're on their holidays, they know they've got two weeks off, they've got six weeks off. Whereas within this process, we don't know when you're going to be going back to school. We don't know when you're going to be starting secondary school or primary school. But I would spend some time noting down what your actual concerns are and what questions you really want to, want to be asking um, just now. And there's no reason why, you know, getting in contact with your named person um, and bullet pointing that list of, of concerns and questions to actually let them know what, what you're worried about, what your young person's worried about um, as well, um, you know, with regards to whether or not they're going to need that enhanced transition. Is there going to be anything in process where there may be a smaller group who can um, socially distance that can be taken into the secondary school or the primary school to be shown around just so that they're actually getting themselves familiar with, with the actual facility they're going to be attending. That's obviously slightly different when we're talking about secondary school and that's where it would come and going into university or college. Um, obviously we've had the, the, the sort of the problems with the exams as well um, where you know they didn't sit their exams. We've, we've not really got any idea what, what those estimates are going to look like until we get the exam results through um, in August. Um, but each university and college does does have a support network and a support team for children, uh, for young people with additional support needs. And they can be contacted to ask those questions as well, um, especially if it's a case of that maybe there's an extra visit required or whatever, it, you can still have that conversation. They might not again be able to give you much information at the moment because we're still in that period of lockdown, but hopefully that will, will they will be able to put some of your, your, your fears to rest. Um, with that conversation. And that's really where we, we would say is, is always contact your named person. Even if your young person is transitioning to the university and college, you can still speak to your named person or the person who's actually dealing with your, your transition um, planning to sort of ask those questions. They may not be able to give you those answers just now, but at least you've had the conversation and at least you know that they, they're gonna be able to go and find out that information for you. So I'm gonna stop sharing the screen just now. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Alison and to Sean. Hi everyone, um, as Karen said, I'm Alison. I work for the National Autistic Society at the Pines in Inverness. Um, and we're absolutely delighted that Sean has been able to join us on Zoom today. Aside from uh, looking for work to keep the lights on, I'm an actor, a writer, a martial artist and disability advocate. And I've spent my time down here mostly inserting myself into Glasgow's cultural scene and engaging in for-profit and not-for-profit arts work. A busy, busy person. So probably yes, but has that been a positive transition for you? Uh, it has 100% been a positive transition for me. That's fantastic. Always good, always good to hear. Um, so what do you think are the biggest barriers to making a successful transition from school? Uh, lack of opportunities and principally a lack of belief, both from others and consequently ourselves. Okay. Um, um, and what ideas have you got? What can parents and professionals do to help young people with transitions? Largely mitigating the effect of those two points stated above. Be attentive, open and willing to set a good example. Okay, that's great. So 
can you just tell me a bit more this was sorry this wasn't one of our scripted questions but just tell me a bit more about what you did after leaving school did you go to college i did i went to the uh, university of the highlands and islands Inverness college campus i did uh, a degree not the full four years just the three in uh, the i think it comes down to drama and performance They've moved, they've moved names and titles around, but it's drama and performance when I did it. Got my degree. Uh, I then did a, uh, a five, a five venue uh, week long tour uh, with the Scottish Youth Theatre National Ensemble. And at the conclusion of that tour, I then moved to Glasgow. And that was uh, August last year. Uh, I very much fell into it half by accident, half by design. I did, I've always been a writer. Uh, I've always been a writer, I've always been a creative, but I had never considered acting in the slightest. Uh, it came about with my exam results. Uh, not great, uh, not nearly what I would have hoped for. And one of my, uh, one of my mentors uh, at the autism drop-in in Inverness, the one-stop shop, uh, recommended I, gi I give it a go. I turn up, I do whatever, and I can say that it was an experience that I had and he thought it would be good for me. Fast forward about three, four years from that point on, it's now my actual line of work and I very much wouldn't have considered it uh, if I had just been told to go off and make my way. It was careful guidance. I've had, I had support within the Melbourne ASN department. Uh, I've had support in uh, my college years through UHI's kind of support team. Uh, but the One Stop Shop has been the, like the longest consistent out with my family uh, influence on me. Uh, I did have, I did have a brief stint with the Shirley Project. Uh, for maybe about six months, maybe less, but that was also arranged in conjunction with the one-stop shop. And I can hold my hand up and say, I am not, I would not be doing what I am now or be the man I am today without their help. Being independent is, it's something I never thought I would do. And the more I think about it, the more I can't figure out who put that idea in my head. It's been, it's been difficult. It's a lot of juggling. It's a lot of making your own accommodations. But I ultimately believe that as long as you've got the support in place and people think about it hard enough and go for the options, it's something that every autistic adult should experience in some way, shape or form. It's not going to be easy, but it's definitely doable. Just in terms of personal development and just kind of capabilities, if, if I had tried to do what most people do, which is leave, uni, uh, leave school and then immediately jump off to a four-year uni course in a place I've never been, probably wouldn't have gone that well. Uh, but it's the kind of thing that I had a brief stint of uh, living independently uh, during my uni time in Inverness. And basically, it's, it's the, something you can only really learn on the job. It's you can only really work out the problems you're going to have by doing it in at least a controlled environment. And so by the end of my kind of UHI tenure, uh, I had sort of decided, okay, what's my next step? I know it's not in Inverness, which necessitates, you know, living independently and making my own way. And then I then found the, the Scottish Youth Theatre uh, National Ensemble, which was a year long project. And by the end of it, I'd made enough connections. I'd seen enough of other towns and cities and made friends, one of whom I don't know if you can hear in the background rummaging around my kitchen, but they are currently my flatmate. And it was through the connections I made through that project, I was able to be independent.
So I, I arrived uh, to Melbourne Academy uh, quite literally kicking and screaming and uh, was pretty much immediately taken to the ASN department and basically introduced to everybody and they said, if you need them, they're there. And after I calmed down and, you know, uh, regained most of my social functions, I was then put out back into the kind of classes, got to meet people, and it's a lot, especially that first couple of days. It's going to be a lot of information, a lot of new sensory input, and, but it will pass. Like every, every transition eventually becomes a new normal. That's kind of the goal. And I found the, at least the department where I was in, very good at managing to get routines in place, uh, I was eventually taken up music for one period a week so they could check up on me and just for some extra time. Uh, but as uh, the older I got, uh, the older I got, the less, the less the department could do for me, particularly because I'm in a quite a strange position I found where I was definitely looking to go to university. I was looking to do English originally uh, or anything and it was and my grades were not reflecting that. And a lot of the work that's in uh, ASN departments is mostly geared to either getting, like passing grades as that, that's the standard. You go in and it's like, if you get passing grades and you do your courses and you do whatever, that, that is great. That is, we have achieved our goals. The only problem was is that I didn't need help passing some of the classes I needed help in making sure I could achieve my potential, which was a little bit, which was the kind of sticking point for, uh, for my experience. One thing I will say, I discovered years later, a pair of these collapsible ear defenders. This is my second pair in purple, uh, <laughs> so hard, harder to lose, but I have discovered only in the last year or so that they are invaluable at keeping me focused and keeping me like on a level, even if you don't need to use them all the time, just having them there has been a fantastic benefit uh, for me because it cuts down on sensory stimuli and it basically allows me to focus in crowded environments. And if I'd had those, uh, if I'd had those during my teenage years, things would have been a lot easier. I have many, I have many, many, many. I just have to pick one. And ultimately, I think it's like, you can do it and you're not fragile. Okay. That, that's the one thing, because it's, I have done things I had never considered possible even years ago, right. like years, six months ago. And I was like, I, failure will not break you and you are a lot stronger than you look. I, I became very good from an early age at just kind of locking my entire body down. So I would have kind of a horrible like rush of emotions, a lot of chemicals uh, in the bloodstream as it were, and I would just kind of just not engage, just not, just that, and the only issue I found with that was on the outside, I masked perfectly well, but on the inside, it was a horrendous experience that nobody should really be doing on a regular basis at the age of 14. It's not great. It makes you feel like you've aged like 20 years in about a week and a half. Uh, these days, uh, the ear defenders are a great help, but it's mostly been about about dealing with that kind of adrenaline and that kind of, because it's, it's a system that I have always found autonomous to my conscious thought, where it's like, I know this is not a fight or flight situation. I know going to my first day of secondary school is not going to kill me. I know that, but that, but that's how it feels. It is real, genuine, terror and it's the kind of thing what I've been doing a lot recently uh, even up till months ago uh, I've just started being more compassionate 
to my kind of body in the way that it's, it only wants to help you. This kind of, this surge of adrenaline, this surge of blind fear, the energy, and you're like, I can't sit still. I can't do what this situation is asking me. It's like, you can, you can channel it. You can't ignore it. Because if you ignore it, then it will just, center in on itself and you'll get frustrated angry and you'll feel horrendously ill but if you actually go okay i'm about to go for an exam but go on stage i'm about to do something if you actually let it help you it's a much more positive experience and that took me years to get to this point where i wasn't worried about dealing with the consequences of all that and uh, actually kind of taking on that kind of confident to be able to say that I'm, I'm confident enough in myself and in my ability to manage my condition, I can do that. But that's, that's the long road. And even to this day, I will immediately before going on stage, I am a mess. I am an absolute shaking quivering mess but as soon as I step up it all goes into the work or it just vanishes and it's it's been it's been I've been working on that for a solid probably eight ten years and long may it continue <laughs> My guess, I have a similar thing. It's largely a sensory stimuli thing. Like I've, uh, for years, I, I cannot stand winter. I cannot stand the cold because as soon as I'm under those conditions, it spikes my adrenaline immediately. And I'm in quite a lot of pain. And everybody gets that, you know, stepping from hot to cold. But the level of it is incredibly intense sometimes. Yeah. And it happens very quickly. So in terms of, it's probably a case of the home, it's an environment they know. Environment they know, they know where, if they need to hide, they know where to go. If there's somewhere dark, if they know where to get away from whatever stimuli is causing the issue. Yeah. In somewhere like a nursery, there might not be the option to do that. Or there might not, there might not be the, social capability to go actually i just need somewhere where this isn't present yeah i i've said, i've said to my friends and my colleagues uh, if in doubt and i start to shut down or i'm incredibly tired follow the jam protocol uh which is put to me in a uh, room temperature dark quiet space and then just leave me there and hopefully i will recover of my own The one thing that I, I took from it was a degree of understanding. It's the case of it's like some things I just could not do. And some things I had incredible difficulties with. But it, the teachers that stuck with me were the ones that both understood that I was desperately trying. I was, I, I had a science teacher, a uh, wonderful man, uh, Mr. Hay, who would proceed to re-explain the same things over and over in the hopes of me getting it. And he could see that I was, I, I knew he would explain it to me and then the next day it'd be gone. But I had to do it and I had to put in the effort. And it was the sort of understanding of like, I am not trying to be either a detriment to your classroom or a disruptive influence. I'm just trying to learn. And some things I found incredibly difficult. My, my personal favorite teachers were ones that would always, no matter, no matter what happened in that classroom, they were always open, engaged, and they also took an interest in my studies more as a method of personal development than as simple rote learning. Like a lot of my kind of political stuff and advocacy uh, knowledge and work has come from my modern studies teacher who was always very much like, instead of, you know, you're here to do essays, it's like you're here to become, you know, fully fledged citizens. 
and knowledgeable of the processes of power and, you, and how you should exercise those hard fought rights. My English teacher, a wonderful man, uh, when I was just starting out to write, I was not very good as 13 year olds often are, but he said, if you want to do this, here are things you should go do. Here is, I see potential. And a lot of the times as, as, an, autistic, uh, as an autistic child, and even as an autistic adult, the lack of assumed potential is kind of the most damaging thing. Because I have done above and beyond what people, done beyond many of my peers and my teachers thought I was, they just flat out refused to believe that I would live independently. And even if they didn't say it, the way they acted around me very much communicated that impression. Sean is not an ideal educational candidate, therefore the best we can expect for him is to kind of muddle his way through school and then go on to do whatever. And that, I took, I took many years to unlearn that, eventually adopting the mantra, uh, passive aggressive as it is, of don't call me stupid. I'm not stupid because I knew I was okay. I can't format my brain to answer the questions in the way that the English or the history exams wanted, but I knew, I knew my content. I had an understanding of what I was looking at. And just because they couldn't see it didn't mean I didn't have it. And even to this day in rehearsals, I'm, I'm always kind of having to prove that it's like, no, I am, I am not your token disabled rep. I'm a fully active member of this process. Uh, ignore that at your peril. And kind of having the confidence to do that has been a large part of what I've spent my post-school years trying to attain. No bother. I mean, I'm still learning now. I mean, it's taken me, I was, I was told, I was told slash went along with it that I couldn't handwrite any of my stuff because I eventually gave myself a repetitive strain injury and nobody can read my handwriting. It's just impossible. I have had, I have had many people try and it's a source of great amusement in the flat uh, to get people to read my work. Uh, but I discovered very recently uh, that handwriting is how I work, how I work in any of my, and I I now do most of my my scripting work on a whiteboard. I have to stand. Uh, my phone, uh, which is currently conducting the Zoom call, is on my standing desk, which is three desks stacked together with a book holder on top. And how I normally work is I'll take my whiteboard, I will, I will do everything in a very idiosyncratic and. Uh, slightly odd manner and then I will work on my standing desk or with some music on and I will handwrite my work and I always wondered when I was younger why can't I do what I feel I can do like I know I, I have all these ideas I can't put them on paper it was like, uh, some of it was purely method in that nobody nobody in their right mind would have said to actually be a creative professional, you need a whiteboard, space to paste, and a standing desk, because that's not what you get given in school. That's how are you meant to find out? So you have to, every autistic person is gonna have their own incredibly specific strange way of learning. And it's being able to do that on a consistent basis is, if he learns best, you know, like reading, running around for 10 minutes, coming back, and then that helps it go in, that's kind of how it's going to have to go. Right. And in general, finding out, figuring out how you work as an autistic adult and child is part, of, part and parcel of what we do. It's incredibly tiring, uh, but it's incredibly necessary. So in terms of like only going in for 50 minutes and going into the class and then coming out kind of battered, I would, uh, I would recommend online resources, particularly Crash Course. 
I don't know if the name rings a bell. Educational YouTube channel uh, run by John and Hank Green, uh, of authors, uh, web celebrities. They've been doing things for about a decade. And it has, <laughs> it has videos of about 10 to 12 minutes on basically every topic. They do full courses. Uh -huh. And in terms of explaining things in a condensed format, they're incredibly useful as revision tools and just giving a wide breadth of learning. One uh -huh. thing I will, I will say, and it's my personal belief that I'll have to tell is I have found some form of physical learning incredibly useful in terms of regulating adrenaline and making sure I sit down, making sure I'm focused. Okay. And I'm convinced there is a, a martial art, a sport or something for everybody, but especially for autistic well-being. Okay. Just sort of experimenting with being able to kind of let all that kind of, because what uh -huh. I imagine they're basically doing is what I used to do, which is condensing all of their adrenaline responses into a tiny box. Mm -hmm. to see if, like, if that has an actual outlet, if that has somewhere to go, uh -huh. whether it be, I don't know, again, judo, running, swimming, if it's got something on a fairly consistent basis, the amount of focus I was, I'm now able to kind of put together with a little bit of uh, like regular exercise cannot be overstated. Come on, Casey, come with me. I can't know what they are trying to show me for a brother and brother, a typical. Typical.